Well, it's finally time. <laughs> After seven long years, the Xbox One has been playing catch up to the formidable PlayStation 4. Now, Microsoft has finally produced a new console they hope is ready to face Sony. We'll talk about the Little Brother Series X in another video, because I think that's actually a more interesting product. But for right now, we're gonna dive deep into the Xbox Series X, the world's most powerful console. When the Series X was first revealed at the Game Awards 2019, it wasn't entirely clear if this was the start of a new generation or just another Xbox One refresh. While the naming scheme they settled on certainly didn't clear things up, it's apparent now that the Series consoles are in fact part of a new generation. But as I think you'll come to see, Microsoft doesn't necessarily want you to think of them that way. The Series X is the flagship product coming out of Redmond, Washington this year, and has a commanding asking price of $499. And that's provided you can actually get your hands on one. Supply line constraints mixed with your typical holiday season scarcity means it could be a little while before these things are actually readily available on store shelves. For your money, you get a 4K capable gaming machine, next generation features, Ultra HD Blu-ray player, one terabyte SSD storage, and an 8K HDR capable HDMI 2.1 connection. If you decide to buy one by the end of this review and you feel like trying your luck, you can use our affiliate links down below. Unboxing the Series X is a pointed acknowledgement of how the industry has changed over the last few years. While unboxing videos and YouTube reviews certainly existed back in 2013, they certainly weren't the mainstay of the consumer technology segment they are today. Microsoft apparently recognized that unboxing their new console should be a special experience, not only for the customer, but also for the millions of people who are gonna be watching. The easily removable tape that doesn't ruin the finish, the direction the box opens, the black foam padding, the insert inviting you to power your dreams, and the delicately wrapped console all indicate that this thing was designed to be unboxed on camera. The console already feels next generation before you even take it out of the box. Apart from the console, you get a quick start guide, a new matching black controller, and a high-speed HDMI 2.1 cable. Xbox engineers kindly added a bump to the cable that lines up with a bump over the HDMI port on the back of the console. So you can easily plug in the cable without having to pull the console out and find the port. The carbon black finish is more of a dark gray than strictly black and takes on a completely different color profile depending on the way the light hits it. The dimensions of the device are demonstrative of Microsoft's laser-like focus on performance. At 15 centimeters wide, by 15 centimeters deep, by 30 centimeters tall, the Series X is shaped like no other console before it. It is built to be 100% functional. While this unorthodox design seems imposing at first, when you take all dimensions into account, the console sits under 6.9 liters. Now technically, that makes it smaller than the original Xbox One's 7.2 liters. And that's of course not taking into consideration that console had an external power supply. Many people have noted how closely it resembles other consumer computing devices like the Mac Pro trash can and Corsair One, and that's for a very good reason. Similar to those aforementioned devices, the Series X places all of its cooling surface area at the center and uses a single fan to suck in fresh air and exhaust it out the top. This design is simple, compact, and impressively quiet, but did require a departure from what you would typically expect a console to look like. While the purposeful industrial design is attractive in its own right, subtle green accents can still be found in the exhaust holes on top. Although it's very much intended to be oriented vertically, small rubber feet on the right side allow it to be placed on its side if that better suits your entertainment center. Just make sure you keep enough space between the sides of the console and the surrounding walls to make sure it gets adequate ventilation. Microsoft is labeling the Series X as the world's most powerful console, and the specs would certainly appear to back up this claim. Under the hood, you have an 8-core Zen 2 processor that can run at a maximum of 3.8 gigahertz. Paired with that new silicon is 16 gigabytes of lightning quick GDDR6 RAM, up to 13 and a half of which can be used for games. Graphics are handled by a new GPU built on AMD's RDNA 2 microarchitecture. Running at 1.825 gigahertz and boasting 52 compute units, Microsoft claims this graphics processor is capable of more than 12 teraflops of computational goodness. Rounding out the spec sheet is a custom PCIe 4 
NVMe 1 terabyte SSD. It's important to keep in mind that not the entire terabyte will be usable for games. After the operating system and other non-user accessible items take their cut, you're left with about 800 gigs to play with. While the drive is only about half as quick as the rival PS5, the 2.4 gigabyte per second raw and 4.8 gigabyte per second compressed rating is still a massive leap over traditional spinning hard drives found on all previous generation consoles. We're talking like 40 times faster than the Xbox One X. While a one terabyte solid state drive sounds impressive, some newer games have absolutely exploded in size, making storage expansion all but inevitable. Microsoft took a very different approach to storage this time around. While the Series X still supports external USB drives, it also has a proprietary expansion slot around back. This purpose-built storage technology was designed to support Xbox's velocity architecture. There's a whole article linked below on the details around this technology, but I'll do my best to break it down for you quickly. There are two main types of storage that computers and game consoles use, volatile and non-volatile. Volatile essentially means that all data is lost when the system loses power. RAM is volatile, hard drives and SSDs are non-volatile. The benefit to volatile storage is that it's incredibly fast, significantly faster than even the quickest SSDs. Xbox engineers are attempting to blur the lines between these technologies by allowing the system to treat the SSD as a pseudo extension of RAM. This is some pretty cutting edge stuff and for this reason requires a specialized controller and interface, thus the proprietary storage expansion. For best results, you'll want to keep the games that you want enhanced by velocity architecture on your system or expansion storage and everything else on your external drive. This strategy allows for some really advanced next generation experiences, such as quick resume, and I'll get to more of that momentarily. A common theme we've seen across all ninth generation consoles is an overall reduction in port selections. The Series X is no different, with an I.O. variety that's noticeably trimmed down. On the front of the Series X, you'll find a single USB 3.0 port alongside power and peripheral sync buttons. Around the back, there's two additional USB 3.0 ports, HDMI 2.1, proprietary SSD expansion slot, Ethernet, and a power plug. At first glance, the controller that comes with the Series X looks identical to the previous generation, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Xbox controllers have consistently been considered by many to be some of the best in the industry, but visually, there isn't much to distinguish a Series controller from an Xbox One controller. The overall dimensions have been scaled down ever so slightly, and the ergonomics have been tweaked to better accommodate hands of different sizes, but even holding them side by side, it's almost impossible to tell. The grippy texture introduced with the newer Xbox One controllers returns, but has now been extended to both the triggers and bumpers. The beveled top third of the controller's face has been completely smoothed over and houses a new black Xbox logo. The controllers are so similar that many previous generation chat adapters and battery packs are still compatible. From a technical standpoint, there have been a handful of improvements. There is now a share button to make capturing and sharing your favorite moments easier. A new hybrid D-pad is clickier and more similar to the one you find on the Elite controllers. USB-C replaces the micro USB connection. Integrated Bluetooth LE improves battery life over Bluetooth. And an enhanced proprietary Xbox connection decreases latency and improves stability. The controller still uses AA batteries instead of an internal rechargeable battery, but there are legitimate pros and cons to going this route. Ultimately, it boils down to the Xbox prioritizing a lower upfront cost to the consumer by using AA batteries. As an added benefit, the Xbox One controllers will work with series consoles and the series controllers will even work on the Xbox One. Many headsets are also going to be supported on the new consoles, including the second generation Turtle Beach Stealth 600 and 700. Watch our reviews of those devices up there in the cards and stay till the end to learn how you can enter to win your own Stealth 600 Gen 2 headset. Powering on the device, the first thing you'll notice is a refined boot splash screen. Instead of blasting your eyes with green, a more mature Xbox logo appears and just a hint of green light shines behind it. The console will then prompt you to finish setting up the device through the revamped mobile application. While the app isn't required to set up the console, it does allow you to configure many of the Xbox settings while the console performs its updates, such as language, location, power modes, sign-in settings, and update preferences. Finally, you can give the console a name and even import settings from a previous generation console associated with your profile. 
If you have a decent internet connection, the update should take just a couple minutes before you're welcome to the home screen. If you use the Xbox One interface in the last few weeks, this should be very familiar to you. Xbox One consoles received an update recently that makes it look just like the layout that you see here. The biggest departure from the previous home screen is the restructuring of the interface to have the section stacked vertically. No more using the bumpers to tab left or right, everything is vertical. If you don't like the sections provided by default, you can now completely customize the interface to your liking. The top section is always going to contain your recently used games and applications, your library, and spotlight items such as sales, new game releases, and anything else Microsoft wants you to see. Everything below that is fair game. You can list broad sections such as Game Pass or the store, or even highlight more granular things like a specific game or individual friends. If you happen to like somebody so much that you want to give them their own space on your Xbox dashboard, you can do that. The key takeaway here is that it's entirely yours to personalize. The enhanced customization options allow the Xbox guide to be reordered the option exists to customize the theme and color, and you can even make the home screen tiles more or less transparent. Backgrounds can be either a solid color, game art, achievement art, a custom image, screenshot, or a dynamic background. The dynamic backgrounds are abstract pieces that move subtly in the background of your home screen. The selection of dynamic backgrounds is very limited right now, but it can I can only imagine it's going to grow in the future. This is also one of the few features that is completely unique to the series interface, and I imagine this is due to the increased processing overhead required to run moving graphics while keeping the interface smooth. There's a robust Xbox companion app that's been around for a long time, but it's recently undergone a massive overhaul in preparation for the series console launches. The app allows you to stream games from your console to your phone, control your console with virtual remote, join chat and voice parties, buy and download games to your console, and most notably, view and share game captures. While it's always been possible to share your favorite moments directly from your console, having them readily available on your phone offers much better flexibility. There's been discussion lately around the lack of exclusive launch titles on the series consoles. I've seen hashtag Xbox has no games floating around on Twitter, and I find this a little confusing. Now it's true, you typically would like to have a few IPs ready to show off the capabilities of your new console. Put an F in the comments for Halo Infinite. However, there are over 50 new or enhanced games launching for the series consoles. Over 600 backwards compatible Xbox 360 games, 39 backwards compatible original Xbox games, and on top of that, every Xbox One game will be playable on the new consoles at launch, with the exception of games that require the retired Kinect peripheral. All in, you're looking at a library of over 2,700 games ready to play on day one, and over 30 additional games coming by the end of the year. I should also mention that games will not need to be bought again if you purchase them digitally for previous generation consoles, or if you happen to still have the discs laying around. The only thing missing are the killer exclusives. However, with the developer spending spree that Microsoft has been on over the last two years, I truly believe those exclusives are coming. Additionally, Game Pass makes it easy for you to try out a wide selection of these games for a monthly fee. Now, Game Pass isn't exclusive to Xbox consoles, as you can download Game Pass for PC on Windows 10 computers and on many mobile devices and enable game streaming. With the recent acquisition of Bethesda and the inclusion of EA Play in a recent announcement, Game Pass is a very enticing proposition. Okay, but how was the actual experience with these new consoles? Well, I connected the Series X to a 75-inch 4K 120Hz television to really put the console through its paces. It's important to note, though, that the television came out in late 2019 and does not have HDMI 2.1, which is the required specification to deliver 4K 120 FPS or 8K 60 FPS content from the console. So for our testing, I was limited to 4K at 60 Hertz and 1440p at 120 Hertz. Now this didn't really affect our testing for another important reason. The Xbox Series X is capable of displaying 4K 120 Hertz content, but the library of games that can run at that speed is going to be very limited. Microsoft is targeting 4K 60 FPS for their first party catalog, which is still a really impressive figure, considering the 4K 60 benchmark was a performance goal only for the highest end computers just a few years ago. This leads me to an important observation. 
Higher resolution means more pixels of information are squeezed into a display, providing a sharper image and greater clarity. However, this increased pixel density is only going to be noticeable up to a certain distance. On a monitor on your desk, a higher resolution is more noticeable than on a TV positioned on the other end of a room. Frame rate is the number of images that are sent to a display every second. A higher frame rate makes movement appear smoother and is clearly noticeable no matter how far away the display is. Hopefully you see what I'm getting at here. Even on a 75 inch TV, when I'm sitting 15 feet away, the higher frame rate is way more appealing than a higher resolution. This will also depend on the game and the type of experience you're trying to have. As you might expect, the visuals coming out of the Series X are superb. The console automatically detects the capabilities of the display it's connected to and adjusts itself accordingly. As I mentioned, my display is only capable of providing either a 1440p 120Hz experience or a 4K 60Hz experience. In the Xbox settings, I was able to toggle which one I wanted for a given game. I selected a wide variety of titles across multiple genres and spanning all four generations of consoles. Forza Horizon 4 has been optimized for the series consoles and provides a glimpse of what future Series X games are going to look like. This is a title best enjoyed at the highest resolution possible to take advantage of the extra crispy textures and assets. Gears 5 also looks fantastic and has received updates specifically for the Series X and Series S. Doom Eternal is a gory masterpiece and is notoriously well optimized for even basic hardware. However, the fast paced action means you may want to prioritize frame rate over resolution if you have to choose between the two. Doom Eternal does not currently support 120 FPS on Series X, but I imagine that will come eventually. Halo has been a mainstay of the Xbox ecosystem since its inception, and the Master Chief Collection will soon receive an optimization update specifically designed for the series consoles. Considering the relative age of most of the games within the MCC, these may be experiences that can run at that 4K and 120 FPS figure. While games from the Xbox 360 and original Xbox era are easy enough to run at 4K and 120 FPS, it will be up to the developers if they want to update the games to support those higher refresh rates. I will say games like Dead Space 2, which suffered from significant aliasing on its initial Xbox 360 release, look much better in 4K. While the increased performance is obviously the headlining feature that will motivate most people to upgrade their systems, I'm going to argue that Quick Resume is a more impactful experience overall. By caching information into the solid state drive, the system is able to quickly recall that game dump the next time it's accessed. A splash screen appears briefly before dropping you right back into the action. You can have a handful of modern AAA games or lots of older backwards compatible games suspended at one time. What's really impressive is that Quick Resume works even if the console has been completely powered off and unplugged. This really demonstrates the power of Xbox's velocity architecture and its ability to use system RAM and solid state storage in a way to deliver a truly next generation feature. Blistering fast speeds are another staple of this generation. For the first time ever, consoles are getting the speedy goodness of SSDs that PC users have enjoyed for a long time now. Downloading games from the store does not require the better part of an afternoon that it used to. The download times were not quite as short as I was hoping for, but considering the speed of the internal SSD paired with my wired fiber connection, I suspect the bottleneck must have been somewhere on Microsoft's end. Load times have improved dramatically, and this is especially noticeable in large open world games with notoriously lengthy loading screens. While it takes some getting used to, I've come to really like the new Xbox interface. I've already talked at length about the recent changes, but the UI on the series consoles is noticeably snappier and doesn't seem to get hung up as often. I unfortunately was not able to get my hands on a proprietary expansion card in time for the launch of the console, but I can at least give you my impressions of the technology. First of all, I understand why Microsoft went with this approach. While the drive speeds are certainly slower than the rival PS5, the ability to instantly switch between games via quick resume without having to cold start them makes starting load times essentially irrelevant. You'll obviously still have to deal with in-game loading sequences, but these are usually of much lesser consequence than the initial start screen. I wasn't able to test a new expansion card for myself, but I was able to test the traditional external drives. 
I plugged in an external two terabyte drive that I've been using for my Xbox One for the last five years. And to my surprise, not only did the Series X instantly recognize the drive, but all the games on the drive were immediately available to play. I was worried that newer Xboxes would require me to format the drive, and I would then need to re-download all two terabytes of games I've accumulated, but I'm happy to report that that is not the case. My key takeaway from my time with the Series X is this. Xbox no longer suffers from an identity crisis. When the Xbox One was revealed, it was pitched as an all-in-one TV, cable, streaming, connect, multimedia, entertainment, do-it-all center hub. Oh, and it could also play video games, I guess. As it turns out, that's not really what anybody wanted. After the disaster of E3 2013, Xbox had preemptively lost the console war to the PS4 and spent the rest of the eighth generation walking back many of those bad decisions. Thankfully, under the direction of Phil Spencer, the Xbox One did eventually become the amazing console it should have been when it launched, but of course this was too late. With the ninth generation of consoles rolling out, Microsoft is getting another shot and is apparently doing everything in their power to avoid the mistakes made seven years ago. The Xbox Series X knows exactly what it is, the world's most powerful console. Now, does that mean I think you should go out and get one? While the specs are certainly impressive, there aren't many games out there that use them to their full potential. The Series X is a formidable console, there just aren't really a lot of reasons right now to upgrade if you already own an Xbox One, as most titles coming out on the series consoles will also be releasing on the Xbox One for at least the next year or so. Yes, you will get higher resolutions and frame rates where supported, but only if your TV or monitor can handle it. If not, you'd really be hard pressed to see the difference between a game running on next gen hardware versus a game running on last gen hardware. Now this will change eventually as Microsoft finally releases some quality first party titles made for the series consoles and to take full advantage of their processing power. But for now, you'd mostly just be upgrading for improved resolution, frame rate, and user experience. If you still want a Series X and missed out on pre-orders, don't feel too bad. Unlike previous generations, Microsoft isn't going to punish you for not getting a new Xbox on day one. Are you buying a Series X or are you gonna pick up a PlayStation 5? Maybe you're getting both. Let me know down in the comments. All products mentioned in this video can be purchased using our affiliate links. Down there, you will also find links to purchase our custom t-shirts and those sales help us out directly. As I mentioned previously, my friend Josh Kicks is hosting a giveaway of a Turtle Beach Stealth 600 Gen 2 headset. Find his Instagram in the description below and make sure you subscribe to this channel to catch all of our Xbox and PlayStation coverage. Thanks for being here and we'll catch you in the next one.